Hello everyone, welcome to the first video of the Capstone exam prep course. Now, this first video is just an introduction to Capstone, the module. Uh, and the reason we have this video is that the Capstone subject is so incredibly different to the other four subjects. The four core subjects being your fin, tax, math and audit. Capstone doesn't follow the same structure. It doesn't follow the same marking criteria. In fact, everything that you've learned in terms of how to approach a subject, throw it out the window because it's gonna be completely different for Capstone. So on the positive side, Capstone is overall, it's a lot easier to actually pass this subject. Most people don't fail this subject. Although many people do find it very difficult just because they've gotten so used to doing four core modules the same way and then all of a sudden Capstone comes out of nowhere uh, and it's a completely different way of studying and learning and being marked and so forth. So let's start off with the introduction. So the first thing to notice that what I'm going through now is your CSG or as they call it at the very front, candidate resource material, so CRM. I'm still gonna call it CSG though, just to be consistent. But the first thing you'll notice about the capstone module is that what's included in this CRM or this CSG is completely different to what's in the other subjects. There's actually no core learning material that you actually have to learn. Um, so it's not about learning uh, information and then remembering it and understanding it and bringing it up in the exam. What it is about is learning how to apply, uh, or first of all, bring, bringing together all of your knowledge from all the other subjects together, but more about bringing together and refining your analytical, your written, your communication, uh, and your advice skills into a single subject. Uh, and the reason we have this subject is to apply in the real world uh, what we've learned in the CA modules and bring it all together into a single product that's applicable for the real world. Because when you're gonna be going out there in your job, you're gonna be giving advice to clients. Uh, you're gonna be communicating with clients. You're gonna to need to be concise. You need to figure out what the key point is and uh, explain why that is the key point and so forth. So you'll notice that what we have in here in this CSG is just some overview topics. For example, uh, just your standard learning outcome and your module plan, which is included in all the other modules. But that's just about where the differences, the, sorry, the similarities end. Because after that, what we've got is measuring your performance rubrics. So this is probably the most important section of the entire CSG. If you remember back to high school, what a rubric is, it's a series of uh, what you have to do to get full marks uh, in answering a particular question and it'll also give you guidance as to what a average question would be or a bad question would be so you know what to avoid as well. And you'll notice that they've got a different rubric for different types of formats. They've got one for analysis and evaluation. So looking through data and coming to a conclusion based on the data. Next is written format. So how clearly and concisely you can actually write what you're talking about uh, and get straight to the point. Next is providing advice. So actually figuring out what the correct uh, solution is. Uh, and so first of all, making sure that you've selected the right one. And number two, how you've actually communicated that to, to the client as to why that is the key issue. And then finally, presentation, which is about if you're you know, speaking, public speaking, how's your you know, eye contact, voice projection, confidence, and so forth. The section after that is activities. Now, this is probably the least important part of the whole CSG. And we're not actually gonna spend much time going over these at all. And the reason is these come up in your workshops on the weekend, but the way I see it is it's just time filler because it doesn't actually impact your mark at all. We'll go through that very shortly, how those marks are actually allocated in the capstone module. But my philosophy is if it doesn't give you marks, if it doesn't contribute towards your final score, in the capstone exam, we're not gonna spend any more time on them. So you will need to do them for your, just so you have them ready for your capstone class. But if you're not gonna get a mark for it, it's not really worth spending too much time doing them. As long as they're just done and dusted, um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. And then finally, we've got the toolkit. And the toolkit is just a few pages of uh, some of the key information that you might need all in the same place. For example, some of the ratios you might have from math uh, maybe some of the operational frameworks from math as well and so forth. Um, so we'll come back to that a little bit later, but it's not super critical. So let's start off with the overview, which is just the first 
introduction to capstone along with the timeline um, and a few other things. So first of all, what is the purpose of the capstone module? So it's really bringing together all of your core base modules together. And capstone is really just the hat on those four foundations. It brings everything together. And the idea is to make you as a CA candidate, a value add and uh, ready for the workforce and a, and a real value add into the workforce. So it's bring together your technical knowledge, your outside the box, your communication skills, your problem and analytical uh, solutions, as well as your judgment, professional judgment, and then finally your well-developed well research skills. So it brings all of those together, uh, and that's what CA is all about effectively. So it's your technical skills, but it's also those qualitative sides, um, which allows you to communicate that technical stuff to clients, uh, to associates, to juniors, to seniors, and so forth. So let's talk about the module design because this is really important to understand because it's so different from your other modules. So this is how your marks are gonna be allocated. So if you remember from the other modules, it's typically 80% in the final exam and then 20% in your online quizzes. With Capstone, there's no online quizzes, but also more of your mark is allocated into these workshops as well. So. With the other modules, it, if you if you did well in your exam, it didn't really matter, all right? But for Capstone, you kind of have to do well in all of the assessments, which is why uh, when we go through this module, we're gonna be placing almost equal weighting in terms of how you actually approach these different assessments. So for example, your first one is your written assessment, and you do that in your workshop, which is on a weekend, in workshop two. And then workshop three is a team presentation when you're actually presenting to your class and that's worth 20% as well. So we're gonna go through that. We're gonna show you some examples, how to approach it, any tips and, and things like that a little bit later on. And then finally, you've still got an exam, but it's only worth 60%. So it's not as critical, uh, still important, but you do actually need to pay just as much attention to these earlier assessment tasks as well. Um, but on the flip side, it just it also means that if you do well in workshop two and three, and these series of videos will enable you to do that, it just takes the stress off and the pressure off a little bit for your final exam because let's say you get 20 out of 20 for both workshop two and workshop three. It means you've got 40%. So that means to pass your final assessment or to pass the whole, whole capstone, you really only need to get an extra 10 marks or 10%. So 10% out of 60% is not too hard to get. Um, and not only that, but the, in, this, in this final exam, they actually give you some of the information before uh, the exam. So the way the exam works for Capstone is you have to write three essays, right? And that might be broken up into smaller questions as well, but typically it's three main essays. Um, and what they'll do is they'll actually give you a pre-release. So they'll give you some information uh, that will be provided in the exam. They won't give you all of the information. For example, they might not give you the numbers, etc. But there's a lot of, there's a lot you can do with that pre-release information. So what I recommend to do is actually to prepare as much as you can but these essay draft structures with the pre-release information and then once you actually go into the exam and see the rest of the information you can hopefully fill in the blanks it's being about it's being able to be adaptable uh, and coming in with a very rough structure which isn't going to be final but gives you a good basis uh, to work with okay so let's move on to learning outcomes which is the next section so it does actually assume that you know all of the content within audit uh, fin, math, and tax. So of course, you have to have completed these um, core modules before you can actually undertake fin, uh, sorry, before you can un undertake capstone. Um, so they can actually ask you or provide information around anything within these topics, but don't worry, it doesn't get too technical. Um, but just keep that in mind that you do need to kind of understand all of these topics to some extent to do the capstone module. Um, Okay, so if we just quickly go through the learning outcomes, because this will help give us the context as to why the capstone module is structured as it is. So the first outcome is access data, analyze information and synthesize knowledge. So most of the capstone module is going to be about, they give you a case study or they give you some background essay and you actually have to look through it and identify all the key issues. Then you have to explain why they're the key issue, uh, link it back to the question. So bringing in key data doing some analysis on the numbers, like looking at trends and using that, and then making a judgment at the end as well. So what are the key critical issues out of the six 
uh, main issues that you've identified, which one's the most important one, and why have you chosen that to be the main, the most important one. And then you might also select another one and say, this was not the most important one because of this reason. So it's about analyzing the text, bringing together all of your knowledge from the previous modules and within the question, uh, and then coming out with an answer that's correct. It's also about communicating effectively. So there's a lot of communication elements within this module. So for example, there's a written assessment, there's a team-based assessment, so working with the team, there's a speech assessment, so making sure that you can actually present well. Uh, and then in your all of your written answers, including the final exam, which is the last one, you've got a very strict, strict rubric, uh, which tells you exactly what you need to have done at minimum to get full mark for a particular question. So it's good and bad, but it, we're gonna spend a lot of time practicing how do you actually write an answer so that it exactly satisfies the rubric and that follows a very specific structure. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But there is a formula that you can use effectively. Um, working in and leading with teams. So, you know, unfortunately Capstone is a, is a difficult module in the sense that you actually do need to come in on the weekend, meet with other people, uh, attend these lectures and then there's a group assignment as well so you actually need to work with these other people um, and it's worth about 20% for the, the team presentation as well. Behave ethically so that's probably more just a, a high level point which comes up throughout. Solving business problems so this is an important one because um, you actually do need to come up especially with those written solutions and your presentation as well plus all your exams. When you set out all of the issues which you identified as part of the analyzing section, you need to come up with conclusions. So not only do you need to select which one's the most important issue, but if the question poses a particular problem or a question, you need to come up with a solution for that, um, take into account everything, uh, all of your technical skills, all of the information given to you as well. And then finally, thinking critically. Um, so it's being, about, it's being able to think um, from different stakeholders' perspectives. It's about thinking from the question and saying, what do they actually want us to achieve? Um, and being skeptical uh, about certain organizational problems and, and things like that. So they're gonna give you a lot of information. And what you'll find is that you'll go through the, the question, you'll go, okay, I've found five issues. And then later on you realize, as you read it through, maybe for the third or fourth time, you're like, oh, what about that? There's a little bit of information from there which could mean this. So it's really about thinking really hard about it, thinking outside of the box. Um, this might not make sense to you right now because we haven't actually seen any of the questions, but it'll make sense by the end of the module. Just keep in mind, it's a very different approach uh, to the other modules. Uh, lifelong professional development, we can probably skip on that one and integrate technical knowledge and professional skills. So that one's just saying, you know, pull in your knowledge that you've learned from your audit, your math, your tax, um, your fin, which will come up. Okay, so, and then so in just in terms of your module plan, um, so that the, probably the most important thing is just to highlight the fact that there's three workshops. Uh, they are on weekends. They're probably about three weeks apart or four weeks apart on average. The first workshop is probably more about getting to know the people, who's in your team, um, and then going through the activities, etc. which I mentioned before is probably a bit of a time filler. Um, and then workshop two is actually when you've got that first initial written assessment so we'll go through that in a later video about how you actually approach that. We'll go through some past written examples so you can see the best way to do it. And then finally workshop three, that's your team presentation where you actually have to give a speech and you have to actually work with your team to present that. And then finally your written exam, um, which is three main essays for that. So let's go through some of the frequently asked questions next. Again, I probably wouldn't do this for the normal uh, modules but I'm gonna go through it just because Capstone is so different. So I mentioned before, there's three workshops that you need to attend to, um, and they are quite annoying. They're not difficult, but they're just a little bit annoying because you, have to, you do have to be there in person, and it is all day, and it's on a weekend, so you kind of lose you know, most of your weekend. So it's a full day workshop. This bit is really, really, really important. You must arrive on time. Basically what happens is if you arrive late, like five minutes late even, they, have, they are instructed to not let you in to these uh, workshops. If you turn up late on the day of the exam, they will not let you in, okay? So 
you need to be there early. So I would recommend actually turning up at least 30 minutes, if not an hour before, because what happened when I actually went through and did the capstone workshop is they had these massive train delays on the day of my exam. Even though I was there, I was on track to be 45 minutes early because of these train delays. I literally got there within a few minutes to spare. It would have been an absolute nightmare if I came in late. A girl actually did come in late and they didn't let her take the exam. So just be really careful. Make sure you arrive early on all three sessions. It's just not worth the risk. You can't change workshops. You do get lunch at these workshops though, which is, which is pretty good. Um, it's just smart casual for the workshops. Um, you don't really get a choice who you get allocated with. They'll just allocate teams with you and you can't change them. I guess the reason for that is uh, it's just like they're trying to prepare you for the workforce in a sense is that you don't always get along with people in the workforce and you don't always get to choose who you work with in the workforce. So you just kind of have to suck it up and get along with who you've been allocated. But the one, the one positive probably of these groups is if you remember from university that probably the group presentations were really hard because a lot of the group you know, would just disappear right until the end. They didn't really care. Um, probably the, the quality of people you get in the CA workshops is a lot better. So your team will actually want to contribute, generally speaking, and they probably will be of a bit higher quality, a bit more motivated. So don't worry too much about that aspect of it. So attendance at all the workshops is mandatory. You can't skip any of them. So there's three to attend. Um, and what happens if I arrive late to a workshop? Well, this is what I mentioned before is they won't actually let anyone in. It says all workshops start punctually at 8.30 a.m. No candidate will be admitted to a workshop after 8.45 a.m. It says 15 minutes leeway, but from memory, they, they didn't let anyone in after 8.30 opening date. So just be careful with that timing as well. And if you are ill for an exam, which does happen, you need to apply for special considerations. So you need a doctor's certificate and you need to submit that to the CA within five days of the workshop. So I would just recommend turning up early for all of them, even if you are a little bit, you know, <laughs> Uh, under the weather just because they don't take it lightly. And then finally, what is the, in the pre-release background information? So I kind of went over this a little bit um, already. So it's, it's, it's not quite the full background question that you'd normally get. And it's similar to your other past exam papers, uh, probably, you know, your fin, your math and so forth. When you go in your exam question, you might have a one page of background information. With Capstone, it's probably a bit more. It might be three to five pages of, of information because the whole question is is based around you trying to pick up that little information in there and applying it uh, using your critical thinking to the question. So there's a lot more information to work with. So what they'll give in the pre-release information is maybe one or two pages, maybe two pages max, no numbers. And then you go into the final exam, they'll give you the rest of the information, which is probably additional numbers, additional information, which you probably wouldn't have been able to gather from the initial pre-release. But as I mentioned above, we can actually prepare some initial draft structures of responses because we can kind of speculate uh, and fill in the gaps using critical thinking. So in terms of assessment, so I mentioned before, workshop two has got a written report worth 20% and workshop three has got your team-based presentation, which is worth 20% as well. You don't get any marks for attendance. And importantly, you don't get any marks for filling in those activity questions, okay? That's just to fill in the time and kind of learn um, and make sure that everyone's actually doing something in those, in those uh, modules. But my recommendation would be to focus on these two assessments instead, making sure you get down pat your essay structure and actually learning how to adapt to a question following the rubric. That's really important. So how will the assessments be marked? All capstones marking is performed using the rubrics. These can be found measuring your performance section of the CRM. So that's just down below in the same document. But what I've done is I've actually split it out into a separate document. So I've just got these over here and I recommend you do the same. But we actually split this out in the capstone critical files and notes so you can get this separately. But you can see over here is a quick example. So what is a rubric? It's just a range of assessment criteria, expected performance standards. So you can see they've got a different rubric for each of them. So you've got one for analysis and evaluation, number two for written format, number three for presentation, number four for providing advice. And you can see in the two workshops, so the written one, you what the marker will be using the first two rubrics. 
so the analysis and evaluation and written format. Whereas for the uh, workshop two, it'll be analysis, evaluation, and written format. And then the workshop three presentation, it will be the third and fourth ones. So it'll be the presentation one and the providing advice one. Whereas the final exam, it'll be similar to, um, it'll be a combination of the ones above. So it'll be the analysis and evaluation and the providing advice. So we'll come back to that, but that's a good way of figuring out, okay, before your first assessment, let's just pull out this, those two, so this is your first written assessment over here. That workshop one is just a practice round, just kind of teaching you how to use the rubric and so forth. This workshop two is the important one. So what I would do before you're on is actually pull out those two rubrics, the first two, put them on the side and just always refer back to it. Make sure what I'm writing, does that actually answer the rubric? So they've got different standards over here in terms of what you want to do is you want to get advanced for all of them. Okay, so you, you can see over here, this is an example of the first rubric, analysis and evaluation. So you can see they give you examples. This is the ideal one. This is where you want to land. So you want to do everything that's listed in these columns. And on the right hand side is the worst scale, so incorrect. So these are the ones you want to avoid. Um, so, and it gives you different uh, different ranges. So proficient might be like a four out of five or a three out of five, whereas an advanced might be a five out of five, for example. And if you're getting a four out of five in your um, first written assessment, you can go and say, okay, look at it against the rubric and say, okay, what did I do wrong? I can see both of these is correctly explaining an issue. However, this one is linking to an other relevant strategical operational information from the case. So linking it back to the information that they give you and explicitly explains why the client should be informed of this issue. So always linking it back to, this is from the case study and this is why we need to tell the client. Whereas if you're proficient, you're only doing one or the other. So you're only linking it to the case or you're telling the client why they should be informed of the issue. So as long as you follow this formula, you should be able to get a five out of five, which is good. It tells you how to get full marks. So we'll come back to that. Let's just keep going through this. So will I get feedback from workshop assessment? So yes, you will. So you'll receive your workshop. So the first assessment in workshop two, you'll receive the advice and your feedback in workshop three. Um, but you won't have time to get your feedback from your workshop three because uh, there's no workshop after that. So what they'll do is after you do your speech, they'll give some high level feedback on the same day. So how is the exam structured? So it's worth six, the final exam is worth 60% as opposed to 80% of the other core modules. And the final exam will take three and a half hours. It will consist of three written questions. So you will receive the pre-release background information to help you prepare. And we'll go through in a later video, some prior year past releases and how we can go through that, look for key information, prepare our structure. And then we'll also go through the process of once we've got that structure, looking at the final exam paper, what was actually given that year, and then comparing the two and saying, okay, how do we actually adapt that once we go in? Um, our past papers example, yes, you can pull some from my learning. Past requirements, if I fail the exam, can I still pass the module? Yes, the overall pass requirement for the capstone is 6%. Unlike the technical modules, there is no requirement to pass the exam to pass the module. So that's why it's really important. So if we go back up to how the marks are allocated, I mentioned before, if you were to get 20 out of 20 out of workshop two and three, which is possible, um, you know, even if you're not gonna do great, you still might be getting 50 out of 20, 15 out of 20, that's still 30 out of 40. So let's do some quick high level modeling and see what mark you'd have to get in your final exam if you got different scenarios. So let's say in workshop one, workshop two. I think most people could reasonably accept, expect to get 15 out of 20 for both workshop two, I should say workshop two and three. So we'll say maximum score 20, 20. Example one. So let's say you get 15 out of 20 for the first one, 15 out of 20. That means you're now 30 out of 40. So get a passing score in final exam, all you need to do is get 20 out of 60, all right? Total. Because you only need to get 50%, right? So 
So 20 out of 60, that's only, that's equivalent to... So you'd actually only need 33% in your final exam in that situation if you were to get a 15 out of 20, which is very achievable. Um, and that 33%, so what, what we were talking about a second ago is that in all the technical modules, even if you'd got 20 out of 20 for these ones, and therefore you only needed a 10 out of 60 to pass the exam, if you were doing the technical modules, you would still need to get 50% in the final exam, so you'd actually need to get at least 31 out of 60 to pass the entire module. That's not the case for capstone, so it's a lot easier. So you'd only need, in that instance, 10 out of 60 or 17%. So you could actually tank the final exam, wouldn't really matter. That's why capstone is probably one of the easiest subjects, in my opinion, but people still do fail it. Um, like you don't want to miss one of your workshops, for example. If you get, then you're going to get zero. Let's say you turn up late 30 minutes, you're going to get a zero for that exam. All of a sudden, you're going to need 40 out of 60. That's a 67%. That's starting to get a, a little bit on the harder end. Uh, and you should be striving to get a merit score anyway on this exam. Capstone's probably your best bet to get one. Okay, so let's get back to where we were. Okay, so let's move on to the next section, which is measuring your performance, or in other words, the rubrics. As I alluded to before, the rubrics are super important because this is the framework that you have to follow and also check back on as you're writing your response after you've written it. Have I followed the rubric to make sure that you're going to get a 5 out of 5 in your response? So first of all, what is a rubric? In case you've never seen one before from high school and so forth. So it's effectively a range of assessment criteria and expected performance standards. So the assessor or the marker is going to look at this, the student's performance against these, rather than assigning a single subjective score. So instead of saying, mm, yeah, I liked this, I'm going to give it a six, what they have to do is, regardless of whether they liked it or not, they have to look back and say, you, you know, it might have been a good response, but if it didn't tick off this part and this part, you can't give them a full mark, even if it was the best, you know, objectively, uh, best objective response you could ever written. If it hasn't satisfied, linking it back to the question and advising the, why we should tell the client. You can't give them the full mark. So it's good and bad. It's bad in that it restricts you know, pure quality answers from receiving a good score, but it's good in that it gives everyone a chance of writing the right thing as long as they know how to use the rubric and apply it, which I'll show you how to do and we'll practice together. So why do we even use rubrics in Capstone? I guess it focuses the instruction. At the end of the day, what, what CA is trying to get you to do is really get you ready for the workforce. And the key skills that they want to hammer home is you know, critical thinking and um, cutting through the complexity and being able to communicate really well and why we need to communicate to the client. So if you get those skills down, down pat really well and then you go out work into a you know, professional services firm, for example, EY, and you've got a tax issue in real life and you need to communicate to the client, if you draw back to your skills from Capstone, you'll be able to identify the key issue that you need to communicate. You'll identify why you need to communicate to the uh, client. You will have identified the fact that you do need to communicate to the client and you'll combine all that, you'll communicate to the client, the client will be really happy the fact that you've done that and they understand what's going on. And you could also apply that to communicating, communicating bad news. Uh, you know, is it you know improving morale in your team, communicating information upwards to a partner in team. There's multiple different aspects. Uh, that's why we're using a rubric is to hammer home those really specific skills and competencies. But it also allows the markers to give feedback really clearly because if you've gotten a four out of five and you go to the capstone markers and say, why didn't I get a five out of five? They can point exactly back to the rubric and say, it's because you didn't do this, it's because you didn't do this. So as I mentioned above, there are four rubrics in the capstone module. There's the analysis and evaluation, there's a written format, presentation, and providing advice. Some of them are applicable for written assessments, some of them are applicable for speech assessments. Okay, so the first two are identical. And as I mentioned before, the workshop one, this one doesn't assign a mark to it, but you actually do a practice written assessment in the workshop one, just so you can get used to using the rubric uh, and you have an idea as to what to expect when you get to workshop two. So most people don't do a very good job in workshop one because they're not used to the rubric. And then by the time they get to workshop two, they'll have understood it, they can do a better job. 
what I'm aiming to do as part of this capstone exam prep course is that I want to get you comfortable with using the rubric before you even attempt workshop one. That way, when you go into workshop one, you will already have a good understanding and you already know how to apply it. And then the feedback you get from that will be the really precise and refined stuff, which will allow you go from, to get from you know 15 out of 20, which is the good but not amazing responses, to the 20 out of 20 responses, which is the exceptional responses. That's what we're trying to achieve here. So when you go into workshop two, you're a step ahead of everyone else and you're ready to do that exceptional response. So those are based on the analysis and evaluation and written format. The reason is written format is self-explanatory because it's a written response, but the analysis and evaluation is more about looking through the data, identifying the trends, and making reference to that in your answer. Okay. Whereas the exam, which is also written response, isn't as much about the written format. It's more about still the analysis and the evaluation, but it's now also about providing advice. So the rubric for that is very much about linking it back to why are we communicating to the client and justifying that particular issue that we've chosen as the key issue. And then of course there's the, the, uh, the presentation in workshop three. And of course it's got presentation as opposed to written skill because it's not a written assessment, it's a speaking assessment. And of course providing advice. So this is more about the, when we get to workshop three and we'll go through some examples of that, the audience of that speech is a theoretical executive team or board of a large company and you're presenting them and giving them advice on a particular topic, which is why we've got that providing advice section there. And of course, we've got different standards here. The one you want to like try to work towards is the advanced one, which is performs before beyond core exception. So that's really an exceptional response if you fall into that category. Otherwise, if it's a good response, it's going to fall into proficient. Okay, so let's talk about the first one, which rubric, which is for analysis and evaluation, which is for the written assessment and also the final exam as well. So when you're going through this, you've got your different assessment criteria, you've got your analysis and you've got your evaluation. Your analysis are your body paragraphs in your written response. Okay, so typically when you're gonna write your written response, you might have a quick introduction, then you'll have a, a body paragraph for each issue that you've identified. And within that, each paragraph which is an issue, you'll discuss why it's an issue, so you see how that's the first requirement for the analysis, why it's an issue, not just what the issue is. So you don't just say, for example, this client has declining revenue, okay? That would be stating what the issue is, okay? That would be a below standard response or a developing response if you just state that the issue is, the revenue is declining, you know, X percent. You need to explain why it's an issue. Revenue declining by X percent or X dollars is an issue because it means that the business may have long-term sustainability issues, liquidity issues because of less cash coming through or sustainability issues in the long term if the company can't continue uh, its revenue trajectory to have enough cash coming in to pay the long-term uh, debts and so forth. So that was just a, a very basic example I just put off the top of my head, but you see how the difference is instead of just saying revenue is declining by X, you're saying revenue is declining by X and it's an issue because it's gonna impact this and this, and they're bad because of this. So that's advanced, and you need to link it to other relevant strategic information. So you know it really depends what they give you in the question, but um, revenues are quite a basic issue, but perhaps they're so we might be looking at a particular question uh, and in that question, in the background information, they've said, uh, this customer has had a referral, uh, sorry, this, this, uh, this business has had a customer referral program with another competitor who's sending its higher premium margin products across to this other business. And you might link that in, you might say, trade receivables have increased by X dollars, which is an increase of X dollars and X percent. However, the the customer referral program from the competitor X, whose product range has a higher sales mix, will have made a significant contribution to this year end's higher trade receivable balance. So that's linking it to strategic or other operational information from the case over here. And then finally, explicitly explains why the client should be informed of this issue in the situation. So. This would still be in the same paragraph, but after that you'd have a sentence where we actually answer that and get the second part of it. So this means that, for example, if I've got more trade debtors, 
this means more money is tied up in receivables, which could have been better put to use um, in other elements of the business, earning a higher return on investment, such as paying off the overdraft facility, which might be another strategic part of the um, background information. So you really got to adapt the question. But in any case, the structure is always going to be the same. It's identify the issue and explain why it's an issue, linking it back to strategic information in the question because they'll usually give you some little tidbit of information which might be the driver of why that thing is higher, like why is revenue declined, why is trade receivables up, why is trade payables up, and so forth. You know, is it because there's, um, you know, have they expanded into a new market? Is there a referral agreement? Is there a decline in the region? You know, there's so many different region, uh, reasons, so it's just linking that back to uh, the key uh, case. And then finally, it's explaining why the client should be informed of it. Why is it a bad issue? You know, why is it a bad issue if your inventory turnover days are up? You know, have you got more money sitting in working capital? And again, this is going back to your math days where you know that if money is locked up in working capital, you're not getting a high level of return on that. So that money could be better put to use in other areas of your business. Therefore, that's a bad element. And just on that note, that's a good point about how all that technical stuff is assumed. So that was from math module, but it assumes that you already know that which is why you need to draw on that. Um, I think the module that this that Capstone probably draws on from the most is probably math, because of math is management accounting. There's a lot of analytics, there's a lot of KPIs and, and linking it to you know, things like that. So next is evaluation of your analysis. So it explains why you identify your principal concern as a principal, uh, principal concern as a principal. So this is, happens right at the end of the essay, and we'll go through it in more detail later and we'll do it when we've actually got an example essay up in front of us so we can link it in to the rubric and see how it works. So in the evaluation, what we have to do in our conclusion is say, we've identified five different key areas of the business which might be of concern, whether it's uh, revenue declining, whether it's trade variables increasing, whether it's cash flow from operations declining, whether it's the interest coverage ratio increasing, uh, maybe it's the fact that they have a bank overdraft, there's so many different things which could pop up. So you list all your different reasons in your essay and that's the body of your essay. And then in the conclusion, you typically highlight to the, to the uh, client what the key issue is. So out of those five issues, you as the preparer have to figure out which one is gonna have the most material impact on their business. So for example, cash flow management is usually a very important one because if the business doesn't have cash flow, it might not have enough money to pay its bills and it might be illiquid. So you might identify that out of the five reasons you've identified above, that cash flow is the most significant issue. And you'd actually write a conclusion along the lines of, based on the above analysis, the principal concern facing this company is cash flow management. Uh, and then you might put some information in which links it to the question. For example, whilst the cash flow this year is higher than previous years, uh, it's, it's atypical and based on temporary sales and so forth. Um, and this is an issue because the firm will be unable to meet future PPE investments, which might be a, something like a qualitative piece of information from the question, background information, which we're linking to, and that will force them to either cut back on dividends or increase their debt. So you've explained why that's the most significant issue, but you also need to identify, see this and section down here, you also need to identify why the other issues you identified above were not your primary concern. So you need to say something like, another issue that the, this company had was the interest coverage ratio. And you need to identify why that's an issue. For example, the firm not complying with it uh, would allow the bank to demand full repayment of the loan and hold the dividend. So you're identifying that that's an issue as well. However, this is where you really distinguish yourself from other marks is that you now have to explain why you didn't put this one as your primary concern. So you say, this is not the principal concern as the firm has not yet breached those terms. And if they did, they will work with the bank and the company to renegotiate the terms rather than demand immediate payments so the risk is uh, slightly mitigated. So you've said it's an issue, but this is why it's not the most important issue, which justifies why you've put this other one as your primary issue. It's a little bit confusing, especially if this is your first time looking at the rubric and thinking about how it works, but hopefully this will sink in. And if we go over this enough times repeatedly, by the time you actually get to your first written response, plus when we've actually had a look at some sample essays, it'll start to make a lot more sense. And then when you go into your first written response, it should be pretty easy. 
Okay, um, so I don't want to go into too much detail on the rubric any further than that. What, what we'll do is we'll have a separate video just on rubrics and then we'll do some deep dives as we get to each of the past assessments. And I don't want to repeat myself too much. So I think you've got a good understanding of how the rubric works and how to apply it. Obviously that was just the first rubric, that was just for analysis and evaluation. But if you're doing your first written response, you also need to take this into account. So for the written format, you need your a written response needs to follow this structure. So it needs to have an introduction, it needs to have a body, it needs to have a conclusion, and overall, this overarching concept there, it needs to be clarity. So it needs to be well structured effectively, which is what this is about. It's about your structure and the clarity and the ease of, of um, reading it is. So how I would suggest before we go into any further detail is first of all, just lay out your essays really neatly. So make sure everything's separated by paragraphs, you know, underline your headings, put dot points and indent your paragraphs as needed. Just make it really easy for the marker to see what you've done. I know that's easier said than done because when you're in pressure in your exam, you might've forgotten a paragraph, you gotta scratch it out, come back, write it, it's all messy. But just try and approach it from a very logical and neat perspective, it'll make your life easier. So if we just do a quick deep dive and we'll go through, like we'll give you some past example essays so you can see how to structure an introduction. But at a high level, the introduction will be your first paragraph and it's gonna explain what the purpose of this report is. And you'll link that into the question given to you. Uh, for example, if the question given to you uh, in the exam paper is, assess the performance of a business and its ability to pay a dividend out of cash flow. You know, the introduction is probably the easiest part to actually ad hoc and ad lib. You would say something along the lines of, the, the purpose of this report is to assess the performance of company X, its ability to pay a dividend out of cash flow. We'll be drawing on several key issues to make this assessment and we'll make a conclusion at the end uh, in order to choose the most pertinent issue and why this was the case. That's, that's just a very basic uh, example of what you would need to do, but whenever you're drafting it, make it as logical as, as, as possible because whenever we're going through this rubric, you'll see that everything is very well laid out. It's very structured. It's very formulaic. So the more structured and logical and formulaic you can make your essay, the higher the chance you'll get of a very high mark. Okay, moving on to the body which is the key issue. So each of the key issues that you'll identify will have its own paragraph. So you'll, that will uh, enhance your chance of having a logical structure. And you can also help your case by having lots of headers, maybe putting dot points as well. So maybe this is your first issue and go dot one, sales, revenue, maybe dot two, trade receivables and so forth. And then you'll have your paragraph down below, very well structured, indented, easy to read and you provide a justified argument for each option presented. However, this kind of links into the first rubric. So if you've done the first rubric well, then you would have satisfied this part over here as well. Um, clarity of written. Okay, so this is probably where it helps to have good English skills because your response needs to be straight to the point, needs to be well structured, needs to be laid out well and you know make reference to numbers and you might say up uh, X dollars when you're referring something like, for example, revenue or cash flow, you'll usually say up X dollars. So, you know, if it's up a million dollars, you say up a million dollars from FY20, which is a 20.1% increase year on year. So every time you mention a number, you're following that formula. We've got the dollar and the percentage and the year that you're actually referring to just helps add to the uh, logical justified argument um, in your response. So it does help to have good English skills, but the way that you can actually counteract that is by coming in with good draft example essays where you can come in and adapt them, but you can broadly follow the structure um, and so forth. That way, because if you're under pressure and you're writing, sometimes you don't always follow a logical and structured approach. I find it's useful to come in with that pre-written structure and just fill in the gaps as you go. It gives you um, a lot more structure and uh, your responses probably turn out a little bit higher quality than if you don't come in with that. And then finally, you need a conclusion. So you need to, I gave you an example of how you would structure it, but it needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, and you need to summarize your main argument. So you don't go babbling on in your essay. Okay, and then you've got rubric for providing advice, which I'll go through in the rubric video. And then you've got your presentation, 
rubric, which we'll go through in the presentation rubric. And now we're on to the activities, which is a part of your CRM. So I mentioned before that you need to do these for your, uh, your classes as you come in. Most of the class you'll spend going through these, but they don't actually add much value and you don't actually get any marks for them. And for the majority of time, people will come in and they're thinking, let's say you're into workshop two and you're thinking about your assessment. The markers still expect you to go through all this stuff first, but most of the people aren't really concentrating on it anyway because they're just thinking about practicing their speech and so forth. So really, it doesn't make a lot of sense why we do them, um, but I'm actually not going to cover this in any detail in this capstone module just because it doesn't add any value to your final mark. Finally, you've got your toolkit, and that, as I mentioned before, is just a series of extracts and key pieces of information that you might need in your, C, uh, in your final CA exam. For example, you've got some key ratios from the math module, like your current ratio, cash ratio. You do kind of use these um, as you're going through, you know, especially your final exam. What you need to do is they'll give you a they'll give you a PL balance sheet, cash flow statement. You need to go through and kind of look at the ratios, how they're changing over time, and whether that's something that should be a red flag that we need to address as a key issue. For example, how's the cash flow from operations? You know, how's your trade receivables? How's your um, you know sales revenue? How's your interest coverage ratio and things like that? Because they all tell a story. Interest coverage ratio, for example, would tell a story as to whether the company's over levered and whether their earnings perhaps have declined where they may have a solvency issue where they can't actually repay their debt based on the current earnings. Uh, so this could potentially be useful. Bunch of financing ratios. We also have a critical file for Capstone with, an, with a number of formulas just refined slightly based on this, which are useful for actually going to your final exam. We've also got some broad frameworks as well. And this is also from the math module. So it's just some of the key risks, key business risks that you might identify. And we do get questions on this. For example, you know, what are the key risks of this you know, case study? And they give you a whole bunch of information. You need to identify what uh, a risk is in a particular category. Um, as this is just giving you some some rehashed information from the math modules, just help you remember that. The risk management process, you've got the you know different types of financing. Again, this is from the math module as well. So it might make sense before you go through the capstone module just to revisit the math module. Maybe even watch our videos from the math exam prep course as well, just to watch them on double speed so you can get through them quickly. Fricto framework is also from math as well. So is the three C's, so is the value chain. So you can see it really draws from the math module a lot. So that's really all that you need to go through from the CRM or the CSG. Everything else isn't really that important. So what is important, however, is understanding the rubric, understanding how to approach assessment one and assessment two, and then understanding how to approach the final exam. So that's what we'll go through for the remaining of the videos. So I'll see you in the next few videos.